It is midnight on October 13th, 2001. The air is electric, filled with promise and hope. It is six months since the University of Maryland men's basketball team had gone where no other Terrapin team had gone before. Yet amidst this celebration of reaching the school's first ever Final Four, 12 men were focused on what, for them, was an unfulfilled goal. Last year we really wanted to get to the Final Four. This year we want to win the national championship. Winning the national championship, I mean, that was the goal ever since we lost our, our last game, you know. At the Final Four last year, and ever since then, that was just our, our one main goal. We had a whole year to think about that loss. I think, like I said before, a lot of guys grew up since then. We knew we were close, um, but at the same time, there's such a big difference between being close and actually winning that we knew we had to step it up if we wanted to succeed the following year. And so, in October, the Terrapins drew a road map, a guide, that would carry them down the straightaways and around the bends that every college basketball season brings. Drawn from experience, bolstered by unity, steered along with passion, and followed with a singleness of purpose, the trail took Maryland on a historic trek through the Atlantic Coast Conference and on to the NCAA tournament. This is the story of that journey, a story of perseverance, a story of heart, will, and desire. The Championship Chase. It's exciting, you know, all our fans are here, everybody who's with them. It's a big day for us. Fresh off the school's first ever Final Four appearance a year ago, the Terrapins entered the 2001-2002 season ranked second in the national polls, the highest ever preseason ranking for a Terrapin team. But an opening day trip to New York to face defending national runner-up Arizona in the Icon Classic brought the championship chase to a halt. Well, it did a lot to us. I mean, you know, coming out that first game, you know, <laughs> I don't think Arizona was even ranked in the top 25. And, you know, we were the number two, number three team in the country. And, you know, Arizona comes in and beats us. And we're like, oh, my God, you know, we got a lot of things, you know, we need to take care of if we're going to win a national championship this year. I think we found out, w which was good, that how hard we had to play just because we had preseason rankings that really didn't mean anything you had to do it on the court and you know whatever we were ranked uh, didn't matter when we went out to play Arizona we, we had to show that we were the better team so I think we learned a lot right away uh, at the start of the season was Maryland still a final four contender a hard fighting championship caliber team to be reckoned with the Terrapins answered that question by winning 10 out of the next 11 against non-conference foes. During this stretch, the road brought the Terps to a major stop against Illinois, visiting Cole Fieldhouse as part of the ACC Big Ten Challenge. The Illini, ranked second in the country, weren't just beaten. They were blown off the court by the tough Terrapins, who built a 20-point lead en route to a 13-point win. Juan Dixon's 25 points were the catalyst, while Chris Wilcox added 19 points and six rebounds off the bench. Buoyed by the big win over a top five team, Maryland was the favorite one week later in the BB&T Classic at MCI Center. And after getting past Princeton in the opener, they faced what would become a familiar foe in Connecticut for the championship. This time, it was the inside play of Lonnie Baxter that brought down the house. Playing in front of a hometown crowd, the Silver Spring native won 8 for 10 from both the field and the foul line totaling 24 points and 10 rebounds, earning the tournament MVP award. I had played in that tournament, you know, many times before, you know, over four years. And, you know, this year I just wanted to make it my last time. I just wanted to make it something special. And, you know, I just went out, you know, and gave it my best. The Terps continued to round into form, winning four of their final five non-conference games by an average of 30 points each. During this run, 
Head coach Gary Williams notched his 250th win at Maryland, and the Terrapins extended their impressive home court winning streak against non-conference foes to 84 games, the longest such streak in the nation. The Terrapins had weathered some early bumps in their road and were off to a 10-2 start, poised for a breakout in the ACC campaign to follow. One of the strengths of the 2002 Terrapins was the leadership provided by its senior class. And that was most clearly evidenced in the play of guard forward Byron Mouton. When he transferred from Tulane after his sophomore season, even Mouton couldn't have known how memorable his time in College Park would be, both for him and for the fans. While fellow seniors Lonnie Baxter and Juan Dixon were ripping the headlines, Mouton was quietly ripping up the court. He got off to a fast start with double-doubles in the first three games of the season. He averaged 12 points a game and shot a shade under 50% from the field. But where Mouton really made his mark was on the other end of the floor. Regularly assigned to defend the opponent's top scorer, Mouton delivered each and every time with a passion and enthusiasm that proved infectious. A hustler, a complete player at both ends of the floor, Byron Mouton did the dirty work that paved the way for the Terrapin success. Everybody got class on your on your team, and you know that's the most important thing, man. How people look at you, and uh, you know I'm gonna remember that for the rest of my life. The Atlantic Coast Conference is one of college basketball's toughest leagues, where no opponent can be taken for granted. It had been 22 years since the Terrapins had last won an ACC championship and nothing less than a near-perfect performance over 16 games would hand them the title this time. Immediately, in their very first conference game of the year, the Terrapins were on the brink against NC State, going eight and a half minutes in the second half without a field goal. But Juan Dixon and Steve Blake produced enough offense late to edge out a win, and the Terps showed the fortitude and composure that would become the trademarks of their championship chase. I think that's when uh, this team realized that we're capable of winning a lot of close games. Last year, we lost a lot of close games, but you know that NC State started guys uh, believing in one another, and we learned how to win games. So I think. But on the road against Duke, a stinging defeat left the Terps at a crossroads early in their ACC season. Faced with real adversity in their championship chase, how would they respond? It didn't take long to find out. As three days later, Juan Dixon and Lonnie Baxter led the way past Clemson. Dixon broke the school record for career three-pointers, and the Terps appeared to be back on track with a win. With our seniors this year, we knew that we were a very good team, and you're going to lose some games. Nobody went undefeated this year. And so, you know, we got through each of the few losses that we did have by just staying focused on our ultimate goal. Challenges continued to confront the team, however, and the Terps trailed by nine with just over three minutes left against Virginia. But once again, the character and composure of the Terrapins shone through, and a 13-2 run closed out the game and the Cavaliers. Now the Terps had won every which way they could in the ACC, by a big margin, in response to a devastating defeat, and when pushed to the breaking point in a single game. What more could this team accomplish? In the ensuing three-game span of rematches against NC State, North Carolina, and Georgia Tech, the Terps developed consistency, winning each game by double-digit margins. A complete team focused on a mission. They were driving ahead at full steam. And if ever there was a time to bring on the Blue Devils, it was now, before a packed coal field house with not only the ACC lead, but the nation's number one ranking on the line. As a week's worth of anticipation built surrounding the Duke game, it was the Terps' senior class, led by center Lonnie Baxter, which kept the team focused. In 2002, Baxter ended his Maryland career in grand fashion, providing the inside muscle and outside touch to become a virtually unstoppable low-post machine. We just try to play a very physical game down low, you know, I mean, I like to use my body as much as possible, you know, and just try to beat people up, you know, wear everybody down. Baxter's farewell tour was all the more sweet because he accomplished it in front of the hometown crowd. 
He was the ACC's leading shot blocker and finished as the school's second leading rebounder and sixth leading scorer. Baxter became the first Turk ever to be named the most outstanding player of an NCAA tournament regional, which he accomplished twice. Yet he was at his best in crunch time, guiding the Terps to victories in this year's NCAA tournament, if not by his body and hands, then by his sheer will alone. In a school that reveres its great big men, such as Lynn Elmore and Buck Williams, Lonnie Baxter joined some elite company when his name was permanently honored in Gold Field House. A true warrior, Lonnie Baxter never worried about personal accolades. Instead, he just preferred to smile and say thank you for a job well done. championship right here, you know, first place, top for first, trying to win it. The college basketball all about, baby, right here. College basketball, I don't get any better than this. You have to help us win this game. But what was to be the game of the year was really a one-sided affair. points and 11 rebounds from Chris Wilcox, Maryland took a lead of 25 points three different times and burst the bubble of invincibility that surrounded the Blue Devils. It was the seventh time a number one ranked team had fallen by the wayside at Cole Fieldhouse. And now, squarely in the ACC driver's seat with a one-game lead, Maryland controlled its own destiny in the ACC. Win the rest and complete the first part of the championship chase. Just 47 years of history on the line, but senior night, an undefeated season at home, and the first ACC regular season title since 1980 at stake as well. Coalfield House opened in 1955, the Terrapins defeated Virginia, which would also be the foe on this historic night. It was a night to remember the past. the present and celebrate the future 112 points later the Terrapins had secured their 486th and final win in the venerable old building the nostalgia of closing down coal the euphoria of winning an ACC championship and the excitement of the road ahead in the postseason combined to create a final night that would not soon be forgotten across the old line state. This is was a great atmosphere tonight, and we closed it out the right way. Came in this season, tried to go undefeated here since last year, win the ACC championship, and achieved those goals. So it doesn't get better than this right now. This ends the season, okay? We're 25 and 3. Nobody can take that from us. We're ACC champions. That's us now. That's us. You know what? We did it in style. We did it in style. Okay? We did it in style. Now we can't be satisfied. You know, we got to go. Bring it in one more time. As champions. What else more could you want, you know, out of a season? You know, you go undefeated. 
you know, at home, you know, the ACC regular season champs, to have your, your jersey retired in the same week. I mean, it was just <laughs> like a dream come true. And, you know, me and Juan, you know, our last game, we just wanted to make it the best. It was a great way to go out. In the storied history of the University of Maryland, no one has scored more points than senior guard Juan Dixon. Blessed with the uncanny combination of a shooter's touch, a lion's heart, and a four general's mind, Dixon led the Terrapins at every step of the championship chase. But Dixon was never about individual achievements. Rather, his legacy stands for being the ultimate team player, making the big shot in the clutch, taking the mantle of leadership with pride. Dixon's rise from the streets of Baltimore has been well documented, and there were many who felt he wouldn't succeed in college ball. But he leaves one mark that may never be matched at Maryland, leading the school to at least 25 wins in each of his four seasons. He was part of a record 110 Maryland victories. The ACC Player of the Year, a runner-up for National Player of the Year, and the most outstanding player of the Final Four. Juan Dixon's name was fittingly hung in the rafters of Cole Fieldhouse. A final tribute to a career that proves the old adage, if you work hard in life, anything is possible. Before I stepped foot on campus, a lot of people around here, a lot of people in the Maryland DC area, they counted me out, man. And I used all that negative, uh, publicity that they were saying and just turned it into a positive and I worked extremely hard develop a work ethic you know with the help of coach Williams and his staff and, and and friends around I was able to become the player that I am today and I just developed each year as a person and as, and as a basketball player and it worked out for me so it was a great run and uh, I'm definitely uh, going to try this uh, four years for the rest of my life. On March 15th the championship chase reached its final stop the NCAA tournament. The Terrapins earned the school's first ever number one seed atop the East region and hosted Siena at MCI Center in an opening round game. Juan Dixon scored a game high and season high 29 points, keying a 15 to four run that opened the second half and put the game away. In round two, Wisconsin appeared on paper to pose a challenge, but on the court, it was a different story. Again, Juan Dixon led the way with 29, becoming the school's all-time leading scorer. And again, a Terrapin run to open the second half decided the issue. Maryland had reached the Sweet 16 for the fourth time in five years. We got a chance to play in front of our home crowd, basically what it was, and we went out there and performed well. My first year, every game we won, we were so excited. You know, we got one more game, we're going to take one more game at a time. and. Uh, you know, this year we was more relaxed and more uh, disciplined, and uh, we handled situations better. We we more we looked at it more like a business trip, and uh, you know we just took one game at a time. And I knew we was gonna be successful this year because everybody was on the same page. At the start of the Sweet 16, the 2002 NCAA tournament had seen a host of upsets, but not one had occurred in Maryland's bracket. The Terps were the first team ever to face all the top-seeded teams in their region adding some more intrigue to the championship chase. Awaiting the Terps in Syracuse, fourth-seeded Kentucky immediately put Maryland's character and poise to the test. Kentucky closed it within three with five minutes remaining, but Maryland answered. Lonnie Baxter and Chris Wilcox combined for 31 points in the paint, keying a 12-5 run that ended the game and sent Maryland back to the regional final for the second year in a row. We felt it, I think, going into the game. Well, it didn't matter what our record was this year and Kentucky's record. You were playing Kentucky in the NCAA tournament. And that made that game special. And K Kentucky's uh, such a good program that they're not going to go away. In other words, we had to go out and win that game. And I was really proud of our guys, especially our defensive performance that night. One step from returning to the Final Four, the Turks faced a familiar foe in second-seeded Connecticut. And an instant classic ensued. The drag down slug it out affair featured 24 lead changes and 21 ties. With 3.43 left to play, Juan Dixon's three pointer tied the game at 77. And once again, sound fundamentals proved the difference down the stretch. Maryland scored in its final eight possessions and converted all eight of its free throws. Then, in dramatic fashion, 
Steve Blake sealed the win with 25 seconds left to play. Blake pulls up, makes the shot from the outside. Got it! A three-pointer by Blake with 25.4 seconds to go. Philippe Brown, left wing, that's off the mark. Back to the rebound, and it's all over. We're going to Atlanta to the Final Four. The Terps cut down the nets for the second time this season. But to complete their championship chase, there would still have to be one more net cutting ceremony in Atlanta, site of the Final Four, where Kansas awaited the Terps next. In an awesome display of school spirit, thousands of Terrapin fans descended upon Atlanta to do their part to bring home the school's first ever national championship. In fact, the Terrapins were the only team from the 2001 Final Four to return in 2002. And that game experience would serve the players well. All the way throughout the whole course of the season, I always talk about the maturity and how guys handle the situation so well. And, uh, you know, the main thing why I think when everybody talk about maturity, but our, our confidence level was so high, and it rubbed on through everybody. Everybody thought we were never going to lose, and no matter what situation we're in, we always think we're going to win. And while we're on the court, it say, no matter what we're going on, we're down by 10, up by 20. We never thought we was going to lose, and that mentality went a long way, and I think that's why we accomplished what we accomplished this year. When Kansas opened a quick 13-2 lead on the Terps at the start of the national semifinal game, many teams would have given up, but not Maryland, not this year. Once we had that timeout, Coach chewed us out, you know, typical uh, Coach Whitten, but, uh, you know, we, was, we responded in a good way. Uh, I responded, you know, just trying to help my team get back in the game, and uh, guys stepped up. With Lonnie Baxter on the bench with foul trouble, Chris Wilcox and Taj Holden picked up the slack in the paint, combining for 31 points, and more importantly, providing key interior defense that held Kansas' star center Drew Gooden without a field goal until seven minutes remain in the game. For the first time ever, Maryland qualified for the national championship game, one step away from completing the championship chase. This is for us, fellas. Okay, we've earned our way here with who we beat. You just think about who we beat in the last three games. Now we got to do everything we can to get ready. We got one more, one more, baby. You know, guys, what happened? We made it to the national championship game, but we had one more to get. While Maryland made it to championship Monday for the first time, they had to face Indiana, a team that had been there five times before and won every one. You have to be really mentally tough going into the game to. to you know, to really get ready to play. And the, the one thing I worried about Indiana, you know, they had upset Duke, and then they upset Oklahoma, two teams that we're very familiar with. So myself as a coach, I knew how good they were. There, there was no underestimating Indiana at all because they had probably played as good a defense as anybody for the feel that, okay, now we've proven we can be as good as anyone, and, and now we're going to try to keep that thing going. National champs. One, two, three. National, National champs! Yeah. Yeah. As the Terrapins returned to their Atlanta hotel, they had finally conquered the elusive summit. And when they received a hero's welcome in College Park, the moment they arrived, a dream denied became a dream fulfilled. It was an unrivaled accomplishment that capped a remarkable chase, a championship chase. Yeah, baby, that's why I came to Melbourne, baby. It's a great feeling, man, I mean, I, I, I could, I'll trade nothing for this feeling right here, I mean, we worked for it all year, so we deserve it. There's no better feeling than be national champs, you know, this is something we work for all year long, and. You know, it's hard to explain. It's unbelievable, man. I never experienced anything like it. I can't believe it. But we finally got it. We're number one. Nobody can take that from us. Considering all everything that we've been through this whole year, um, I can't put it into words right now. I got no words for you. It's, it's starting to sink in now. I come from Chrisville, Maryland, and I have a national championship. It's unbelievable, man. It's unbelievable. I don't even know how to describe it. This is a great feeling. I can't believe it. I got no words right now, but... Uh, you come back to me later on, 
I give you some more hits. <laughs> There's no better feeling than basketball right now. I mean, to win with this group of guys and uh, the way we love each other, it's, not, it's nothing more special. It's just like a dream come true. I mean, I'm still pinching myself. You know, it's just unbelievable, you know, that, that we made it this far. And I'm just so happy to be here. I just want to thank all these boys in this locker room. I love these boys to death, man. Everybody counted me out before I even stepped foot on campus. And look where I'm at today, national title. Nothing like it, the greatest feeling in the world. 